Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. Uh, my name is Darren, one of the pastors here. It is uh, good to have you with us this morning and good to be in the house uh, of the Lord. If you're visiting this morning, you'll notice in the seat pocket in front of you, uh, there is a visitor's card. Uh, if you take a moment, fill that card out. Love to know a little bit more about you, ways that we can serve you. Uh, and you can take that card and you can put that card in the offering plate when it comes by. Thank you so much uh, for your visit. Uh, by way of announcements this morning, if you'd open your bulletin to uh, page 15, uh, allow me to draw attention to a few announcements there. Uh, first of all, uh, our college summer uh, Bible study is uh, starting back. It started last week. Uh, that was a week of introduction, but in full force this week. So uh, College Plus, just pay attention. Uh, you'll be at the uh, Taylor's house today. Uh, directions and time are all there. A way that you can serve... Uh, one of the, uh, apparently College Plus students are hungry. And so one of the ways that you could serve is help prepare a meal uh, for that Bible study. Uh, you can contact Kristen Kenny if you're willing to do that, and she will set you up on the schedule opportunity to serve. Uh, most of you, there are a few that were here early, um, but we, our Christian growth opportunities, we are having a, a break this Sunday and next Sunday. And so if you come here uh, at 9.15, you can join us for corporate prayer time, but our adult and youth Bible study and children's Bible studies will start back uh, on the 5th of June on Sunday morning. And so also today, uh, we are having fellowship lunch uh, after our morning worship service, and so that's why the uh, smell of food is permeating uh, permeating the sanctuary at the moment. So uh, if you're visiting, we'd be honored if you join us for lunch. There's always uh, plenty to eat uh, and to share a meal uh, together. Uh, on page 16, draw our attention to New City Catechism, our question of, for reflection of the week and the answer, question 21, uh, what sort of redeemer is needed to bring us back to God? Answer, the only redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ. The eternal Son of God, in whom God became man and bore the penalty of sin himself. Uh, and so, just by way of reflection and continuing to work on our scripture memory, at this time, Leslie Taylor is going to come give us an announcement as it relates to our women's ministry. Good morning. I just want to let all the women know that our women's summer groups are about to get started again. We brought that back last summer, and it was a, a big hit, so we're going to do it again this summer. Um, these uh, summer groups are consisted of eight separate groups. We'll have four to five women for each group, and you will sign up for that group for the whole summer. The purpose of these is to get to know the women of our church a little bit better uh, if there's someone you don't know to get to get to know them so when you're signing up um, you may want to look and maybe choose something that your good friends are on maybe branch out a little bit we're going to have our signups in the fellowship hall next weekend next Sunday um, there'll be posters um, and in your brochure here it um, it lets you know all of the different groups that will We'll have available, um, the contact person is listed on there, and if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, I will have the basket with these in the back if you have not grabbed one yet. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Leslie. Let me pray for us, and then we'll stand this morning for our call to worship. Let's pray. Our great God, we thank you for bringing us here today. Uh, we thank you for your protection and your provision in the storm. We thank you that you are uh, our help in time of need. And so now as your people, we come. We come and ask that the work, through the work of your Spirit, would you enable us to declare the wonders of your great name. Father, would we not uh, only declare those wonders, but would we know your presence today. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for our call to worship. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 118, uh, verses 19 through 27. I'll read the light print. Please respond in the bold. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. 
This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and that have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray and give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and has made his light to shine upon us. seated. You know, each week we get the opportunity to speak and say God's truth. Uh, it's coming out of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and uh, we've been looking at God's plan of salvation. So may, uh, as we repeat this back uh, in bold, uh, be reminded that this is God's work for us. So I'll read the question, and if you would respond. What benefits do they that are effectually called partake of in this life? What is justification? You know, that truth should drive us, our hearts and our minds, to uh, come to confess publicly. So that's what we're going to do now. Let's confess publicly uh, our, our sin before the Lord. Uh, we'll move into a time of silent uh, confession, and then we'll pray, and then we will be reminded again of God's great truth for us. So let us confess together. Our Father, we acknowledge that we can only stand justified before you. Because of your work, we confess our tendency to cover and hide our sin 
by futile efforts. You see all and know our hearts. Father, our sins and shortcomings present us with a list of accusations and reveal our guilty hearts before you. We confess our self-made attempts to bring about a righteousness that we need. Father, we ask that you soften our hearts and grant us faith to believe the perfect work of your Son. He removes our sin while taking it upon himself. He freely gives to us his righteousness that we do not deserve. In Jesus' name. Father, you do not leave us in our sins. <clears throat> you have sent your Son to come to bring about a justification to be able to stand before you in your holy presence. So, Father, we rejoice today uh, in your Son, Jesus. Amen. You know, each week we hear the assurance of pardon. This is uh, for those that if you are in Christ, you are a child of God. This is truth for you. You are forgiven because we have a faithful high priest that comes to be with us. Hebrews 4 says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we now sing. My heart is filled with thankfulness. pastoral prayer this morning, we have the opportunity to, uh, to recognize uh, those that have graduated, those that um, have worked through high school, college, uh, and then also we're going to pray uh, for Ashley Phillips as she is making her way to Ghana uh, later this summer, uh, or, or actually soon. So uh, let's do this. Let's 
have the, the graduates, um, if you would just stand just for a second so we can recognize you. Um, you can see, you can look around. Yeah, a lot of them are here. So, yep. <laughs> yeah, you guys, it's, a, it's no small thing what you guys have accomplished and, and been a part of. And uh, we do as a church body want to pray for you. We want to pray God's uh, work, blessing, uh, in your future endeavors, because this is a, a, a time of change for, for you. So uh, let's, let's go to our Lord in, in prayer as we come. Father, you, you are our God that directs and leads. And Father, we come to you, Lord, even this morning as we uh, think specifically about those that have graduated uh, high school, college, master's program, doctor programs. Uh, Father, what, what a blessing it is, Lord, that you have given true wisdom, true knowledge. Lord, to allow, Lord, those that are a part of your body here at Emmanuel to, to learn and grow, to further their skills. Uh, Father, we want to pray specifically for them. Father, we give praise for, for Bethany, Lord, uh, her work, uh, Lord, and what you are moving her on next at PBA uh, to dance, to be part of ballet. Uh, Father, we, we pray that uh, you would remind her of your presence, that as I will pray for, for everyone here, Lord, that, that Christ would be central, uh, that uh, Christ would uh, be in her vision, in her heart, in her mind, Lord, that you would use her at PBA, Lord, to be a blessing to others. Father, we thank you for Boone Lynch and the opportunity to, to graduate from Emmy Ribble, that, Lord, we Give you praise, Lord, for the amount of time and work he has put in. And Lord, we pray that you would use him in, in further studies ahead. Lord, that you would grant him wisdom. And Lord, as I pray the same, Lord, that Christ would be central. Lord, in his heart, in his mind. Lord, in all the decisions that he has to make, Lord, with the future. Father, we give praise for Erica Robertson. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for her commitment, Lord, even as she works at Rafiki. Lord, as she labors to teach and to uh, build uh, in Africa, even as she's there now, ministering and teaching, uh, helping with schools. And Lord, we're thankful, Lord, just uh, a pursuit, a desire for her to grow in her knowledge, uh, graduating from Knox Seminary. Lord, we pray that you would use her mightily in Rafiki, Lord, that uh, kids who have nothing, have not, no knowledge, material blessings, Lord, that you would use her and her ministry for your sake. Father, we thank you for Brooke, Lord, and what you have brought her through at, at PBA, and Lord, um, moving on with physical therapy as she pursues a doctorate program at USF. Lord, we pray that you would grant her blessing, Lord, that, uh, Lord, at, at the center of her heart, her mind, her decisions, Lord, would be Christ. We pray the same for Sister Haley. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, for her graduating from a doctor program. Lord, as she seeks to work at, at Cora, Lord, in the area. Lord, we ask that you would use her mightily for your kingdom. Lord, as she works to seek to build back the body, Lord, in so many ways, Lord, you would uh, remind her of even her role and opportunity, Lord, to build your kingdom. Father, use her for your sake. Lord, thankful for my wife, Stacy, Lord, and just uh, the hours and the time, Lord, spent uh, graduating with teaching uh, degree, Lord. I'm so thankful for uh, the time and energy that she's put in. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that you would use her mightily, Lord, as she seeks to teach and to love on uh, young people, especially kindergartners, Lord, who, who need your truth, who need your knowledge. Lord, lead and guide her. Lord, for Sarah... We're thankful for her heart and passion for your truth and your love. And Lord, we, we pray for her future endeavors, adventures. Uh, Father, even possible a move. Lord, we pray that you would bless her, that you would protect her, you would guide her and lead her. Uh, Father, we give you praise, Lord, for all that you're doing. Father, we bring Ashley Phillips to you this morning. Father, she seeks to go to Ghana. Lord, here uh, very soon, Lord, we pray that you would use her mightily as she seeks to build, uh, to be a part of an orphanage where, where kids don't know you that are just seeking true love, 
uh, true family. Father, we pray that you would use her efforts. Lord, that the gospel may go, Lord, to Ghana, to where she's at. Lord, to ultimately that, that students, that kids would come to know you. Lord, use her and her team. Father, we give you praise, Lord, for your work in our lives. Uh, Father, you are the faithful one. You are uh, the one that is steady. And Father, for all of these, Lord, we do pray that Christ would be central, that Christ would be seen. And Lord, that is in your name that we do pray. Amen. Please stand as we now sing before Jehovah's awesome throne. standing for our prayer of thanksgiving. Father, we are grateful as your people. Thank you for uh, your good gifts to us. We thank you for your every provision in our life and that all good things that we possess are a gift from your hand. Father, would you grow in us generous hearts as we now return a portion of your gifts through our tithes and offerings. Would you use this to produce in us a love for your kingdom. And Father, would you use these resources that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here in Delan as it is in heaven. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>
please stand for the doxology. seated. We continue this morning in our study of Mark's gospel. We are in Mark chapter 8. Uh, we'll be looking this morning as our sermon text, Mark chapter 8, verse 22 through the beginning of chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, before the reading, a couple, one aside is uh, I, I will address uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 1 next week. Uh, but it does actually go with this passage, uh, but just due to sort of content levels. Uh, we'll sort of deal with that next week. But let's give attention to uh, the reading of God's inerrant uh, and helpful word for us this morning. Mark chapter 8, verse 22 through chapter 9, verse 1. And they came to Bethsaida. And some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored. He saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. And Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them, to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He turned, seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it a profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So the law is holy. The commandment is holy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your holy, for your perfect word. Father, we ask now that you would take your word and, Father, would you open our ears and open our eyes so that we would hear, so that we would see, so that we would understand and behold the wonders of your word. Father, we ask that you would not only help us to hear and to see, but that you would, through the work of your Spirit, enable us to apply this Word to our hearts. Father, your Word is always a saving Word. And so, Father, we pray that for one who is not in your kingdom would today be the day of their salvation. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. After feeding uh, a mixed crowd, a Jewish and Gentile crowd of about 4,000 at the beginning of chapter 8, 
And after another confrontation with the religious leaders, where Jesus declares that no further sign will be given to them, Jesus is enough, Jesus sets sail again with disciples towards Bethsaida. As we discovered last week in verses 14 through 21, while on the boat, Jesus is revealing the spiritual blindness of his disciples in a conversation about bread. The disciples are not only unable to understand the warning that Jesus gives to them about the leaven of the Pharisees and the willful unbelief of the Pharisees, but they're unable in and of themselves to understand the spiritual significance of Jesus' miracles and words. Like the crowds, they, the disciples flocked to Jesus. The disciples were spiritually blind and deaf and in need of healing. Jesus confronts them with their hard heart, lack of understanding, spiritual deafness, spiritual blindness. Our passage today continues to expand and to deepen that theme of spiritual understanding. The disciples and the crowds, as we saw at the end of chapter 7, are gaining some measure of understanding. Jesus has done all things well as the deaf hear and the mute speak. They declare, God is graciously opening up their spiritual eyes, but they are unable to see clearly. Their spiritual understanding, it is obscured by their sin, and their partial understanding, or picking and choosing, Old Testament prophecies regarding the coming Messiah. So it asks the question again, who is Jesus? What do The words and deeds of Jesus reveal about His person and purpose. This is the question that the Gospel of Mark asks, and our our passage today asks directly. Jesus is asking each of us this morning, but who do you say that I am? What has God been revealing to us about Jesus as we've been studying the Gospel of Mark? So as we consider our passage today, may God graciously open our eyes. May He give us spiritual understanding so that we may clearly confess with Peter, You are the Christ. May we clearly see Jesus this morning. May we clearly see, clearly confess, clearly understand, and clearly follow Jesus at all. Yesterday evening, as most of us experienced, it was a Florida storm. And in some ways it was a whopper, yet not too extraordinary in many ways. I happened to be driving from here to south of the airport as driving through the storm. As we got to the bridge going over Lake Jessup, that's where all the hail kicked in. You could see but you couldn't see very far and you couldn't see very clearly. I grumbled a little bit, as typical for Florida. Some guy blows by me in the left-hand lane and you're just going, he's going to have an accident because he can't see anything. And as we continued to move along, visibility got worse and worse. You could barely see the lights of the cars in front of you and you're going at a snail's pace. Then all of a sudden, on the other side of Lake Jessup, you come out of it And it's sunny. And what? You can see clearly again. You see, clearly see. We need to be able to see clearly in order to understand. Look at verses 22 through 26. It is possible to over-spiritualize the miracles of Jesus. We can be tempted to read more into a miracle than what was intended, right? The miracles reveal the divine power of Jesus and the great compassion of His heart. They reveal, the miracles of Jesus reveal His redemptive purpose of restoration. Through His miracles, Jesus restores that which was broken and distorted by the intrusion of sin into God's good creation. The miracles of Jesus validate the gospel message He declares. The miraculous two-part healing of the blind man in our passage is filled with compassion for the blind man 
but undoubtedly it is a clear spiritual object lesson for the disciples of Jesus. It serves, if you will, as a visual parable. The healing of the blind man outside of Bethsaida is the bookend to the miracle of the healing of the man who was deaf and mute in chapter 7. These miracles uh, and where they're placed, particularly in the structure of Mark's gospel, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit, are intended to reveal spiritual deadness, the need for spiritual new birth. Like the disciples, before you can understand who Jesus is and what He came to do, your spiritual eyes and ears must be open. As Jesus taught Nicodemus in John 3, you must be born again, born of the Spirit, to not only enter the kingdom of God, but to see it. This miracle is simple enough to understand, is it not? Jesus arrives in Bethsaida. Bethsaida was a place that Jesus had visited. This is the hometown of some of His disciples. A town that was familiar with Jesus and familiar with His ministry, but it was a fickle town. It is in the Gospel of Luke. The people of Bethsaida are condemned by Jesus because of their unbelief, their lack of faith. He states if the works that had been done in Bethsaida had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. So the town of Bethsaida is condemned for being hard-hearted and filled with the sin of unbelief. As Jesus arrives, some people bring a blind man to Jesus. They beg Jesus to touch him because they've heard or perhaps witnessed that the touch of Jesus is a healing touch. As we've seen, Jesus touches a leper and makes him clean. A woman touches him and she is cured from the constant flow of blood. Jesus has healed a deaf man, a man with a withered hand, a paralytic, cast out demons and raised a young girl from the dead. But this is the first healing of a blind man in Mark's gospel. Jesus touches him at first, not to heal him, but to lead him out of town to a more isolated place. Jesus is moving him away from the crowds and from their fickle response. Like the deaf man or the mute man in Mark Mark chapter 7, Jesus uses spittle in the healing process, but this time He first spits in the eyes of the blind man and then rubs His hands over those. The saliva and the touch of Jesus are not magical. This is just the medium Jesus chooses to heal with in this occasion. After anointing the man's eyes, Jesus asked him, Do you see anything? He looked up and he said, I see people, they look like trees walking. As a man can distinguish between people and trees, it's reasonable to assume that at one time this man was not blind. Although the man can see partially, he's not able to see clearly. He's not able to distinguish between men and trees. Jesus lays hands on the blind man a second time, and this time his vision is restored fully. He can what? He can see clearly now. Jesus sends him home and says, don't go through town. You see, the healing power of Jesus is not constrained by formulas or procedures. Healing is often associated with his touch, as the crowds have assumed. But as with the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman, at the word of Jesus, the demon left his, the daughter, and she was not even present. So why? So why does Jesus heal this blind man in two parts? Jesus was challenging and revealing the unbelief of the disciples and the crowd. The healing of the blind man reveals their spiritual condition. Jesus wants the disciples and us to see for ourselves who we really are. We are spiritually blind. They are spiritually blind, but they can see in part. God is giving them understanding. Their eyes are open, but they're not able to see clearly yet. They have witnessed the acts of Jesus and have heard of His teaching, but they lack spiritual understanding to clearly understand. In his book entitled Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Cures, Mountain Lloyd-Jones calls men as trees walking a cause of spiritual depression. 
He argues that Christians often fall prey to spiritual blindness where they see in part, but not the whole. Lloyd-Jones argues firstly that the maladies, lack of joy, and why the Christian church counts for so little in our modern world is because they don't really understand the central doctrine of justification by faith alone. You see, many joyless Christians are still seeking to justify themselves. Doing so, they become a miserable lot. Secondly, Lloyd-Jones argues that some Christians are miserable, some Christians are unhappy, some Christians are disquieted because they lack clarity. The Christian faith is, their Christian faith is paralyzed because they simply walk around seeing men as trees walking. The lack of spiritual clarity leads to confusion, a lack of engagement, and a divided and rebellious heart. Perhaps at the root uh, some dislike, quote, clarity of thought and definition because of its demands. You see, like the blind man who is partially healed, the first step to gaining spiritual clarity is simply admitting that we can only see in part. We can see, but we don't yet have clarity. We need to repent of our spiritual blindness. We need to repent of our lack of desire to pursue spiritual clarity. As our reflection quote reminds us from the Westminster Confession of Faith, we need to be humble and open ourselves to the truth of God's Word and ask God to help us see. So by way of application, what do you see? What do I see this morning? Notice in verses 27 through 30, there's a clearly confess. That Jesus and his disciples leave Bethsaida and they travel to Caesarea Philippi on the way. Uh, like lessons on the boat, Jesus has questions for his disciples. Parents, right? Like Jesus, never discount those car conversations with your children. Jesus is now applying the lesson, the message, the visual parable of a two-part healing into the life of His disciples. What do you see? What do people say or who do people say that I am? Men like trees walking. Some say you're John the Baptist. That was an error of Herod. Some say, others say, like Elijah or one of the prophets, they have some spiritual recognition that Jesus is a spiritual man, but they are spiritually blind. Jesus then makes the question personal, doesn't he not? But who do you say that I am? And you can almost see Peter just jumping up and putting his hand up. I know! blurts out the right answer, the good confession. You are the Christ. You are the Christ, God's Messiah, Son of the living God, Matthew records for us. The gospel of Ma- in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Jesus commends Peter for his good confession that God alone has revealed to you, Peter. Peter, the disciples, do they now get it? Are they no longer spiritually blind or are they? Do they see in part or do they see clearly? What does it mean that Jesus is the Christ? Who is the Christ? What did He come to do? And Jesus will test their understanding and the substance of Peter's confession. The disciples and Peter are still See men like trees. How about us? Who is Jesus? Do we truly comprehend not only His title, Christ, Messiah, Lord, Savior, but are we resting by faith? Are we resting by faith in all of whom Jesus is or only in the parts we like. What is our confession? Look at verses 31 through 33. Clearly understand. The disciples see Jesus. 
clearly confess his identity. But they need to clearly understand the deep truths that are the foundation or should be the foundation for their confession. They need to not only see in part, but they need to see the whole and they need to see clearly. The disciples viewed that Jesus was a conquering Messiah. He was the promised son of David who would restore the Davidic throne and establish again the earthly kingdom of Israel. As our passage reveals, disciples viewed Jesus only in a temporal framework. They see Him through the eyes of man, not through the eyes of God. They view uh, the here and the now and not the eternal. Yes, Jesus is a conquering King. But His kingdom, His reign, and His rule is more expansive than Israel alone. The Lord's anointed one has come to redeem and gather God's people, past, present, and future, from every corner of planet Earth. The disciples' view of Jesus is way too small. For the third time in Mark's Gospel, Jesus uses the title, Son of Man, for Himself. He does not reject the title Christ or Messiah, but He takes on the title Son of Man because He's going to continue to provide the content to define this title. Already, if you remember in Mark's Gospel, we've learned that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins in Mark chapter 2. He is Lord of the Sabbath in Mark chapter 2. And in our passage, we learn that the Son of Man will be rejected, suffer, dies, and rise from the dead, and He will come again in glory. Notice, there's a picture of the Son of Man being portrayed for us. The Son of Man will suffer and then come in glory. The cross will lead to the crown. You see, the title Son of Man has its roots in Daniel 7, Isaiah 53, and the minor prophets. Uh, Listen to Daniel 7, verses 13 through 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, the clouds of heaven, there was one like the Son of Man. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before Him. And to Him was given dominion and glory, a kingdom... All peoples, nations, languages would serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. What shall not pass away in His kingdom, no one shall be able to destroy. You see, Son of Man, a kingdom of all peoples. Son of Man, an everlasting kingdom, not just a temporal kingdom here on earth. How will that kingdom come about? Isaiah 52 through 53 tells us that that kingdom will come about as he's despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, from one from from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he bore our griefs and carried out our sorrows, yet he was a Yet he was esteemed and stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. With his wounds we are healed. You see, he's pointing him not only to a greater kingdom than they have in mind, but a Savior who saves through suffering. Listen to Hosea 6.1. Come. Let us return to the Lord for what He has torn, that He may heal us. He has struck us down, that He will bind us up. You see, Jesus wants His disciples to clearly understand that He is the Messiah. And as the prophets of old have clearly foretold, He will suffer to redeem His people and establish an ever Lasting kingdom. The pathway of the kingdom of God is a pathway from suffering to glory. As Jesus reveals the steps that He will take, He will suffer, He will be rejected, He will be killed, and then He will be resurrected. Peter's confession falls apart. He does not yet clearly understand, but He only sees in part. Peter, like the third temptation of Jesus in the wilderness by Satan, has no room for a suffering Messiah. Like the devil tempting Jesus with the glory and the worship of the kingdoms of man, if he would simply fall down before Satan and worship him, 
Peter wants a saving king who will adorn him with the glory of the kingdom of man. Peter longs to be great in the kingdom of man. He does not yet clearly understand the kingdom of God. He has temporal eyes, but he needs to have eyes of faith. Notice this in in his pride and completely revealing his lack of understanding. Jesus, I mean, Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him and seeks to teach him. Like the devil in the wilderness, Jesus rebukes Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You see, in the weeks to come, Jesus will teach Peter and us much more about himself. In his teaching, he will intentionally fill in the content of what it means to be the Son of Man, who Messiah really is, as the passion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ draws nearer in the Gospel of Mark. We need clear understanding. As we consider who Jesus is, do we do so based on the wisdom of man or the wisdom of God? Like Peter, do we confess that Jesus is the Christ, He is our Redeemer, but then we determine the kind of Redeemer we want Jesus to be. Like Peter, do we see in part, but not the whole. Jesus is King, but we simply want Him to make our own kingdoms better. Do we clearly understand that He is our saving King? And as our saving King, Jesus had to suffer. He will be completely rejected. He will die before the glory of His resurrection will come. Are we embracing Jesus, who He says He is? Or is He saying to us, Get behind me, Satan. Your mind is not on the things of God, but on the things of man. We need to repent. Lastly, clearly follow at all costs. Look at verses 34 through 38. Lastly, Jesus clarifies His messianic identity by revealing the cost of following Him. Peter and his disciples must have been reeling from the stern rebuke of Jesus, right? Jesus is revealing to them their spiritual blindness and their need to see clearly. He had heard, right? Uh, their clear confession. But as he tests the clarity of their understanding, it is revealed that they don't know fully who Jesus is. And they aren't ready to follow on a path from suffering to glory. The truth is, most Western Christians, that is each of us, really don't have a biblical theology of suffering. In our passage, Jesus clarifies that we will conquer the, that He will conquer the curse of sin, ultimately death, through suffering. Those who follow Him will suffer as He did. The Christian life following Christ will cost everything in your life to gain everything in eternity. Notice the cross becomes a visual picture of following Jesus in verse 34. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Deny yourself, take up the cross, follow me. In the Roman world, the crucifixion was the cruelest form of execution. It was used for the hardest criminals and the worst crimes. Part of the cruelty of the crucifixion was that the guilty party had to carry his own crossbeam to the crucifixion stand. So like the title Son of Man, here Jesus begins to redefine the meaning of the cross. The symbol of death will become a symbol of sacrificial life. The pathway to redemption, the road of Jesus from suffering to glory is the road, the way of the cross. When we clearly see Jesus, we will understand the Messiah must first suffer, be rejected, and die to satisfy God's justice against the sins of His people. The glory of the resurrection, our eternal hope of glory, our pardon for sins rests fully on Jesus. Jesus is calling Peter. Jesus is calling the disciples to follow Him. 
Calling them to see Him, to trust in Him, to leave behind and repent of their own understanding and their partial sight, to repent of their unbelief. Let us go, let, to let go of their version of Jesus, to deny ourselves and the Savior's after the will of man, to cling to the cross of Jesus where we will find God's pardon and perfection for us. Our justification, our righteousness are found in Jesus by faith alone. We're called to follow Jesus, to follow Him. To follow Jesus will be radical. It will turn our world upside down. It will turn the kingdom of man upside down. As we do what? Our king calls us to live in his kingdom. Notice the description that the kingdom of God is different than the kingdom of man. In the kingdom of God, losing is gain. In the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, you could do what? You could gain the world and lose your soul. Nothing is of greater value eternally than the souls of men. What could price could be paid for the soul of man? The answer to that is. Only Jesus. And if I'm ashamed of Jesus now, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of me when I'm drawn before the Father and the angels in judgment and eternity. Notice that description of the kingdom of God. In closing, just a few questions for us this morning. What do you see? This morning, do you see clearly or do you see men like trees walking? Ask God to open your eyes. What is your confession? Who is Jesus? What kind of Messiah are you making Him out to be? Ask God to reveal your faulty views of Jesus and to give you a right view of who He is on the basis of of His Word. Thirdly, ask God to give you clear understanding. It starts by acknowledging what? Your need for understanding. As your eyes are open to see clearly, to confess rightly, to gain spiritual understanding, ask God to help you to follow. To follow Jesus to fix your eyes on Jesus, to listen to His voice, to follow hard after Him, no matter the cost. The way of eternal life is from suffering to glory. The cross gains the crown. In the kingdom of God, losing is gaining. Your soul is worth more than anything else. So come to Jesus and find life in His name that He may open our eyes to see Him clearly. Amen. Let's pray. Father, that is our need. Father, we need our eyes opened so that we may behold and that we may see the wonders of Jesus. Father, we need our eyes opened so that we would repent of our unbelief, our need for understanding, and that we would rest by faith alone and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our need if we are in Christ, and that is our need if we are not yet in Christ. Father, would you help us as your people that we would listen to the words of Jesus, that we would walk on the path from suffering to glory, that, Father, we would be reminded that our call as Christ's people is to deny ourselves, to rest and take up our Christ daily, and to follow Him. In Jesus' name we pray. Please stand as we now sing, Your Beauty Fills Our Eyes.
you so much with, for your presence with us this morning. Uh, if you have questions, uh, if the beauty of Christ is not yet filling your eyes, are you see in part but want to see fully and truly? Love to have a conversation with you about that and to move in and to dive into God's Word together that He may reveal Himself to us through the wonders of the Scriptures. Uh, I'll be in the breezeway and I uh, would love to either start that conversation or schedule that conversation. But uh, over lunch, as God's people, we should also be having those conversations, right? About the beauty of Christ and the hope that we have in Him. So let us make that part of our dinner or our lunch conversation uh, here in just a few moments. If you're visiting this morning, please stay for lunch. Uh, there is plenty, and we would be honored to have you with us this morning. And so please do that. Uh, although we are in a break from uh, Christian growth for another week or so, that does not excuse us from uh, being in each other's lives. So I want to encourage us to initiate hospitality. Uh, either invite someone over or invite yourself over to someone's house. And uh, uh, let me pray for us. I'm going to pray for our meal and then I'm going to give us the benediction. So let me pray for our meal and bless uh, the meal that we're about to partake, and then I'll close us with our benediction. Uh, Father, thank you for feeding us. Uh, Father, as we eat together, we would, be re would we be reminded, as we just thought about a few weeks ago, that Jesus is the bread of life, and that, Father, we need eternal food, and He is the only eternal food. And so, Father, we thank You, though, that You bless us with these gifts of food to nourish us. And, Father, it's a gift from Your hand, and so we thank You for that. Bless our conversation with one another. Thank You for the many hands that prepared this food. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the benediction, I wrote myself a note, so I better follow it. Uh, as you go through the line, parents, be with your kids. Uh, help them choose appropriate volumes of food. <laughs> there are some teenagers that may need their parents with them as well. <laughs> Receive the benediction this morning. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely 